Welcome to another Behind the Curtains podcast. Once again, uh, my name is Nick Lapalamento. Uh, we have Cole Watkins and we have Taylor Goldenthal. We all three are team leads of the Bridge Group here in Houston, Texas. And if this is your first time joining us, this podcast is all things real estate. What are we seeing uh, in nationally? What are we seeing globally? What are we seeing in our local market? What are we seeing with the team that we run? You know, at this point, we're pushing into 40 agents. So we have a lot of uh, experience, not just our own personal stories, but also the agents that we coach and mentor. And you get to hear from and learn from the experiences of all of them to help you hopefully grow your real estate business. Uh, so let's hop into our first topic today. Uh, the thing that's on everybody's mind, let's talk about the NAR settlement. Uh, obviously, it's not officially uh, settled. There's still a proposal at this point. Um, but what are some of your thoughts on how is this going to affect us? Is it going to affect us? What have we been hearing from some of the agents or people in the industry? Uh, Cole, why don't you kick us off? Well, I, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, we've already talked about this and I think given it so like more attention than it needs uh, right now. But uh, I'll just give you an example of, of ki kind of how most agents are thinking about this right now. I had a one on one with, uh, you know, one of our top producers. He's already got uh, 11 closed and pending on the year. And uh, I said, hey, well, d don't you want to, you know, bump your, your goal up? You're already almost halfway to your goal this year uh, within the first quarter. And he got a little uh, like hesitant to bump it up because he said, I don't know what's going to happen with the NAR lawsuit. And, you know, that could affect my business. And I said, OK, fair enough. How will it affect your business? And he said, well, you know, buyers could go, you know, to the seller or buyers could do X, Y and Z or they might not want to to sign, you know, with me, or it's, it's like a listing presentation. Now we got to pre I said, look, all of nothing has changed. Like have buyers done all of those things to you in the past? Yes. Like they absolutely have, uh, you know, like buyers have said that they would want to work with you and then they go to the builder or they go to the listing agent. Buyers have always been able to do these things. We just have to, to brush up our skills or strengthen our skills uh, and, and our buyer presentation and our uh, you know objective uh, objection handlers when it comes to buyers. Uh, we just got to get a lot stronger. It's not just throw them in your car and you know sign a contract or show some show some houses and send some offers anymore. It, it's it's just like a listing now, uh, a, a lot more commitment like that. So uh, I don't think it's going to affect our business whatsoever. And after kind of going through how just it's going to be the exact same, except the commissions have been decoupled. Uh, you know, a seller can't advertise what they're going to pay the buyer if they're going to pay the buyer. So uh, I just don't think it's going to change that much. I do know that a lot of the the agents that we have currently in this market uh, are already like, like saying this, this is doomsday. Like I'm out, like, <laughs> like uh, I can't meet my mortgage next month. So, and, and then along with this, I'm going to dust off that resume. So that that's what I've seen. But I just think that people are giving it way too much credit uh, than what it deserves. And like you said, Nick, it's not even done yet. It's not even fi finalized. Uh, you know, so people are spending hours online talking about this and everything else where it's not finalized yet. I think the agents that we're hearing from with that perspective so much are the same ones that we're talking about <clears throat> what a terrible real estate market last year was. And right. a lot of us had great years, maybe not record years, but still very good years. So I imagine it's a lot of the same voices uh, that are all doom and gloom about this. Their businesses were already probably in a, in a pretty negative or poor spot overall. So this becomes like the, the almost the excuse. The, oh, this is the reason why my business isn't where it needs to be, why I need to get a job, why whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think anything's ultimately going to change all that much. Um, I, I read a perspective and it was the only thing that's going to happen is our industry is going to become a lot more professional. We're going to have to be a lot more professional in our communication uh, and how we um, how we uh, explain how we are paid. Uh, and it, there's going to be different circumstances um, as far as getting paid out. And if a buyer has to pay uh, their agent's commission, well, OK, if you can't afford to, then maybe we can't go see this home that's not offering a buyer agent commission, but we can go see these other ones instead. Um, and again, nothing's changed yet. Uh, maybe our average commission per deal goes down uh, as uh, on the buyer side of things, but our average tr our transaction counts are going to go up, I think, if we lose agents, which I think we're going to. So maybe you have to sell a little bit more to make what you made uh, selling a certain amount. Uh, but I do think 
uh, those of us that are that are taking this like a, a challenge and being proactive about it are going to gain market share, even if our average commission per transaction may go down on the buyer side. Yeah, I would say the consensus that I've come to after listening to a few people's opinions on like what's going to happen is at the end of the day, the only thing that really changed is how we go about doing things we've already been doing. So it's not like it's not like it's changing the fact that there's representation. It sound it sounded like that was what what it what it was. But then whenever you read this the settlement or the proposed settlement, and then you actually talk through like what does that actually how does that impact the day to day? It's like we were already doing buyer representation agreements. There already wasn't a set commission that was being you know charged to a client. It was all negotiable. The you know there were already homes that were not offering buyer agent commissions. Like all of those things were were already here right now. The only thing is that I guess it's maybe made it brought it more to the forefront it's caused more people to talk about it it's caused it to be on the news and kind of maybe the general public now has more awareness about it um and i think ultimately what led us here was just a lack of transparency and a lack of clarity from agents describing to clients how it is that they are how, how our relationship works with them and what the fees are and how they're calculated and all that kind of stuff and how representation works i think because that wasn't clear this now comes to light and it freaks everybody out. But ultimately, it's really just bringing to light things that were already there that just people didn't talk about or weren't fully aware of. And so I agree with both of you guys. I'm not sure if it's really going to change very much in terms of the agents who are already, you know, following the 80-20 rule, the agents, the 20 percent of the agents that are already doing 80 percent of the work. Like, is this really going to affect their business? M maybe, but probably not, because we're already starting to talk through strategies and scripting and what to say and how to present this. And we were already doing buyer consultations before. So now we're just adding an extra component on that of like, hey, by the way, like, do you have any questions about how my commission is handled? Like, otherwise, the whole process of like, talking about loan, uh, talking about the, the buying process and talking about how we work together and setting the expectations, we, some agents weren't doing that. So this is a much bigger change for them, because they never really did consultations. We already do. So you're sort of seeing, I guess I'm seeing it from our perspective of like not, not much changes for us, but I could see how this really starts affecting those agents who only do a few deals a year, who only have their license for the friend or the family member, the agent who doesn't really know what value they bring to a transaction other than maybe kicking back a percentage of what they make. Those agents, I think, are going to have a harder time because now they have to communicate a value proposition that they've never had to do before or they don't even know what their value proposition is. So now you're going to have more buyers, I think, who will interview a couple buyer agents rather than just picking the first person that they meet because everybody basically does the same thing. Whereas now that there's this awareness of like, oh, I might have to pay a commission. Now they're going to be a little bit more choosy on like who they go with. And they're probably going to actually interview us like we do listing appointments, how they interview agents to sell the home because there's money on the line that they might have to spend. Now buyers okay. potentially... Not every listing. I don't think that we're, it's overnight. All of a sudden, like there's no buyer agent compensation offered. Like I don't. I just don't think that that's real. There's too yeah. many. There's too many agents who understand the benefit of marketing that. So that's that's my take on it. Is I don't think it's going to change very much, but I think it will really affect agents who aren't already doing the things that we already talk about on this podcast that we already teach our agents. Agents who don't already do buyer consultations, who don't know how to communicate a value proposition. One hundred percent. It's going to tank a lot of agents' business. But if you're listening to this or if you're on our team and you're already ahead and you're already doing a lot of these things. So we're just tweaking a little bit as opposed to completely upending how we normally do business. I mean, we saw it in 2021 uh, when the market was just bananas. Right. Uh, and, and sellers were getting 30 plus offers on a house when big box builders were basically saying, take a number, uh, sign up, um, come join us for like the, the lottery and see if you can be selected to build a house and a lot in the neighborhood. And there are several builders like Lennar that just stopped paying realtor commissions. And what happened? I, in particular, had one buyer that said, OK, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go somewhere that's going to pay you. Uh, I want you to represent me. So I don't want to go buy a Lennar home. And we went to DR Horton and I got paid, I think, 5% uh, because DR Horton, where they took that opportunity to leverage and say, hey, let's attract buyers agents. Let's get more buyers in here and let's get our home sold. And they were outselling the crap out of Lennar at that time. Um, so it's just, you know, I, as on the buyer side of deals, I've made $2,000 on a $400,000 purchase 
and I've made five, six percent on purchases. Uh, it's always been negotiable. Now yeah. it's just to your point, Nick, it's just on people's mind. It's on the forefront. But the other thing that I think is interesting, this is all coming out now and it made all the headlines now. Um, and even if it's accepted, the changes aren't going to go into effect until I think June or July. And what is the average like memory span for like the American news cycle? It, it's almost a forgotten memory already at this point. Um, so I truly do think that, I mean, I have the conversation with my sellers all the time uh, that when they ask a commission, we charge 3% for our portion uh, because of everything that we do to market the listings. Uh, whatever you want to pay the buyer's broker is totally up to you. The most common amount is 3%, but you can do whatever you want to do. And they always say, well, what do you recommend? Well, we're going to get the most eyes on the home, right or wrong, however, whether you agree with it or not, at th offering 3%, we will get the most eyes on the home. We're going to get the most qualified and savvy buyer's agents bringing their clients into the home as well. At 2%, depending on the price point, we'll still achieve that same thing. If you go below 2%, you're going to lower shrink in your buyer pool, unfortunately, because there are going to be buyers, brokers, and agents that have buyer agreements in place where they're going to be paid a certain percentage. And I can all but guarantee you they're not going to be 1% or lower than that. Um, and what do they always say? Okay, well, let's do two and a half or let's do three. Great. No problem. Uh, it's a practice that we've always had. You know, uh, The reason why uh, we're in this mess as realtors isn't because of agents like us. Uh, it's because of the agents that don't do these things and don't have open and honest and transparent communication. Um, yep. So again, to the true professionals of the industry, I think your job's going to get easier. Maybe your average commission per deal gets a little bit smaller, but you're going to gain market share and you're going to sell a hell of a lot more homes uh, when we kind of, as Nick, you like to say, Nick, uh, was it cull the herd? Uh, that's exactly what's happening. Culling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and, but also what's easier to do, right? It, it, to, to buckle down, uh, you know, re-strategize, get more familiar with uh, scripting uh, for our buyers and our buyer presentation or appointments or blame the market or blame NAR lawsuit, you know, and that, and I think that's ultimately kind of what Nick was alluding to earlier was uh, we can, we can blame certain things uh, and then, you know, get our resume together and, and go get a, you know, a, another job, or we can just buckle up and say, Hey, uh, we're just going to push on through this and get better, uh, change our systems, uh, change with, you know, what's going on. And, uh, and continue to grow our business uh, even bigger than it was before. So uh, I think a lot of the people that, like you said before, that are not going to take this well are the people that were blaming the market last year. But we have a lot of agents on our team that had their best year ever uh, last year <laughs> and still absolutely kicked ass. So uh, I don't think it's the market. I don't think it's the NAR lawsuit. I just think it's, uh, you know, people, uh, if they don't want to work, uh, they're going to have something to blame for it. Now, what, if anything, do we recommend that agents start doing or start implementing into their business uh, based off of this proposed settlement? If anything, do we recommend? Yeah. It, it, like what we said earlier, like if you, if you have not been doing a buyer appointment uh, or a buyer consultation, that's the first thing you need to do. And it's so easy for us to just put a buyer in our car and start showing them homes and pray to God that they want to make an offer on something we show them. Uh, but we have always, always preached that you should do a buyer consultation so that you can manage the expectations of the client, teach them, show them the journey before we get started. Uh, and it's going to make life a lot easier for you and them. It could be the difference between them actually going under contract and getting to closing and not uh, is the management of those expectations within that buyer consultation. In my opinion, that's where it is. And even ours, we have to change and beef up uh, and add to uh, regarding, you know, kind of uh, the new options uh, for our, our uh, you know, how we get paid. So. Yep, I agree. Right. Buyer consultations. Taylor, anything you feel like agents should think about implementing now in preparation for if the settlement goes through the way that it's been written? Number one, I'd always just say listings last. Um, what are you doing to generate more listings? What are you doing to uh, kind of create this this image of yourself as a listing agent in your market? Um, because you're always going to have the most leverage there. Um, and then otherwise, uh, it again, it's just not being afraid of it, right? I think the worst thing we could possibly do is put our heads in the sand and wait and hope that the storm blows over. Uh, how many agents did that uh, back in 2020 uh, during the start of the pandemic? And they shut down like the rest of the country, their businesses, that is. Uh, and those of us that kept our boots on the ground uh, and, and kept pushing forward uh, with whatever restrictions or changes were in place uh, had 
amazing years. Uh, that year catapulted my career. Um, so I think the best thing we can do is, uh, on one hand, keep doing what we're doing, but also if you're not already treating this like a business and you are already seeing yourself as a professional rather than just like a TikTok entrepreneur or whatever, uh, now is the time to really just button things up a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, what do they say? The, the commercial real estate industry has always been like this. Like you yeah. always, for every commercial deal, uh, there is no offered commission for the buyers or the, the tenants broker. Um, it is negotiated up front. So I would say start brushing up on your confidence and your negotiation skills uh, and, and getting comfortable doing that. If you know that that's a weak part for you, I would find a coach or a team or, or somewhere that's going to offer you someone to be a closer. Um, like for us, uh, we tell our agents, your only job is to be confident, to be professional, to manage the client experience and to set the appointments. We will close them for you. Uh, we will have that conversation with your seller. We will have that conversation with your buyer. So if you're not an agent that is comfortable doing that, I would make sure you're at a team or a brokerage where there's someone that will help you with that um, and just start buttoning things up and, and really treating it like a business ultimately. Yeah, I think there's a couple of resources I would point people to uh, if you feel like one, if you're not fully understanding what this NAR settlement is, what the proposed settlement, I guess I should say is, and how that affects you. Um, if you are in EXP like we are, uh, we actually, there's a recording where the um, where our brokerage essentially kind of described and went through the settlement and how it might affect us. Um, Tom Ferry has done a couple good videos talking about how to adapt on the buyer side and now recently today, how to adapt on the seller side. Um, I think BAM has also done a really good uh, explanation of how to handle that. And I also think um, uh, the one that I sent to you guys the other day, uh, what's his name? Brandon uh, Mulrennan. Yeah, Brandon Mulrennan also has a really good uh, video on it. So these are all on YouTube. Uh, so go look them up, uh, Brandon Mulrennan, Tom Ferry, uh, Bam. And I think these are, are great resources to, again, be familiar with it because it's probably more likely now that it'll get brought up. You know, some you might have a client that says like, hey, so like, how does this whole thing on the news affect me? And if you're not really fully understanding or aware, that's going to make you look like you're not an expert. You don't really know what's going on in your own industry. So at the very least, make sure you kind of understand what happened, what got us to this point and how it might affect us. And then be prepared with a little bit of scripting from some of these videos on how to handle that, how to address it, what to say. Um, because I think if we can message it the right way and we can manage the expectation for clients, it's going to make it a lot easier for us to, to make our way through this and not have it really affect our business. So, all right. So moving on to our next topic, uh, what is, is, we're now moving into the second quarter of 2024. Uh, we're in April now. Um, it's crazy. I was doing yes. some math with one of the agents. And I was like, oh, well, if you get rid of December, then we really only have like seven or eight months. Le like already we're we're running out of time. <laughs> like this year is it feels like we just got started and now yeah. we're already four months in. Um, what do what do you guys recommend that agents in terms of lead gen should start looking at implementing if they're not on track with their goals at the beginning of this year? Circle hey. prospecting. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Cool. No, I was just going to say kind of a, a tying like, you know, or, or joining the last topic and then this one, you know, it, uh, if you're concerned with the NAR lawsuit and how that's going to affect your business, the only thing you can do to combat that is to build a bigger pipeline. That That's it. Uh, like build a bigger pipeline. And that really is the answer to almost every problem within real estate is to have a stacked pipeline. If, if you're if you, you have a bunch of buyers or sellers that are like on the fence and it's interest rates this or it's the market that or it's, you know, whatever else. If you had a bigger pipeline, you'd have people uh, drawing up contracts, you know, a, a lot more. So the, the answer is lead gen on a daily basis. And I think that we always, uh, you know, talk about that at the bridge group. But, you know, uh, what what Taylor said, we, we had an, an agent circle prospecting. If you don't know what circle prospecting is, it is taking a listing that you have or an open house or something, you know, a, a subject property and basically drawing a circle, not literally, but uh, around it and then advertising to the houses around it. What what is going on with that property, whether it's just listed under contract or just sold. And, uh, you know, the, Brandy is a new agent on our team, uh, not new to real estate, but new to the bridge group. And she swore she Nick and I uh, had known her from Launchpad. She had come to our Launchpad uh, uh, sessions many times over and was just like, I cannot will not do uh, circle prospecting. I don't want to knock on doors. Right. 
And so he said, fine. All right. You never have to. Just don't do it. <laughs> and uh, Brittany, who is uh, an agent on our team, a top producer on our team, uh, said in Slack, I'm going door knocking on Monday after team. If you want to come with me, come on. Uh, Brandy took her, took her up on that, went with her and said, well, what was I so afraid of? Like, this is, <laughs> this is great. I'm just inviting people to my open house or I'm just notifying people about the house uh, my listing just went under contract and it's good news, right? We strike up conversations with other people that live in houses that need to sell them. So she starts going out on her own now, circle prospecting her properties, has 16 conversations one uh, one day, 19 uh, the other week, and is getting listing appointments set from the very thing, lead gen activity that she swore she wouldn't do. And it is absolutely amazing to see the collaboration with the team uh, lead to that, but at the same time, uh, just grabbing another lead gen pillar, adding that to her business. And I think, I think combined, uh, she has about three or four pieces of business from something she said she wouldn't do. It's awesome. I think too, when you look at it, uh, the last two months for HAR for the stats, we've had a, a big uptick in listings year over year. Uh, and that's just indicative of the market that we're coming into. I think so you have a lot of sellers that number one, uh, pulled off the, off the market last year, decided not to list their house last year at an 8% rate with economic concerns. Um, and they're having those conversations now. Uh, we're now in April. And when does everybody like to list their house? In the summer after school's over. So if you can start getting yourself in front of people now um, and just offering yourself as a resource. Hey, I oh yeah, we've been having talks about potentially moving this summer and selling our house. Great. Let's get together now and, and strategize a little bit, I can give you some valuable information so that can better assist you with your decision-making in time. How does that sound? So it, it's that element, I think, seeing where we are statistically within the market. And then also um, people have questions. Everyone's been reading articles online about uh, how are commissions gonna change whenever I'm selling my house? And is that conversation taking place at the breakfast table with, with, uh, with a couple or a family? And well, how's it gonna look if we sell our house now? And then, oh, by chance, a realtor just knocked on my door. I was just reading that article last night. I actually do have some questions for them. And if we're prepared to answer questions about this NAR settlement, along with what we've seen in the market, boom, you're an expert coming at them at both angles. Um, I, I truly think real estate for home sellers, especially is the trendy topic right now, uh, because they're thinking, oh man, I don't have to pay a commission anymore to sell my house. Uh, hey, let me educate you a little bit. Um, and by the way, look at what I did for your neighbor. Yeah. Yep. I would also use another example from the same agent uh, that said that they didn't want to door knock. Um, one of the things that we talk about so often is you can be doing all of these activities. You could take all of the 18 lead generation activities that we that we preach and teach, and you could do every single one of them. But if you don't follow up with anybody afterwards, then you're not going to have the same success that we're talking about. Uh, that's only so much to go in. Like if you go and plant all these seeds, but then you never harvest them, then you get no return. So the same agent uh, goes and does an open house and she's been doing open houses for a while, but she goes and does an open house and she follows the follow-up process and she followed up with people that came through and we had a buyer consultation. So I sat in with her and we did the whole thing. And afterwards the buyer gets up to leave and he says, Hey, I just want to thank you so much. This is great. I really learned a whole lot. And also I want to let you know the day that we met, I was out going to open houses specifically because I wanted to meet a realtor to see who might help me find my next home. You were the only agent out of all the open houses that I went to that actually followed up with me. And that's why I'm here today. So I looked at I looked at her, the agent, and I was like, textbook. Like this is this is exactly like what we talk about. And you did it, and then now we have the result. And this person is so happy that you followed up with him. We think following up is annoying, people don't like it. They're going to hate us. It's pushy. It's salesy. When in reality, this guy wanted somebody to follow up. He wanted somebody to prove to him that they wanted his business, that they wanted to work for him. And she was the only one that did it. So I think going along with doing your door knocking, going along with trying to you know meet with people and have these conversations about this new settlement that's coming across and how that might affect things is just doing your follow up that you know that you should be doing, but haven't been consistent with for the first few months of the year now's the time, right? The best time to plant a tree is yesterday. So like you haven't been consistent, get on the horse and get consistent now because people on our team, these agents are starting to reap the rewards of all the prospecting they've been doing for the last few months, but their follow-up is now starting to generate business for them. And so don't just get on the rat race of constantly having to prospect and finding new people. The more you start doing your follow-up and basically harvesting from what you've already planted, 
the sooner you can start building up that base, giving people good service and then getting the referrals in. So you don't have to do all that prospecting. But right now, if you're not doing follow up, it's a never ending game because you're never getting enough clients and you're you're always having to hunt for something new because you're not you're not taking advantage of what's already in front of you. Yeah, no, it's uh, and that that's a crazy story uh, that, that he told you that. I wonder how many people like that. That's the, the the still the same truth for them. They just never tell us that, right? right? Uh, I'm sure it's it, it's a whole lot, but uh, yeah, that that being and I think Nick, you you said something that a lot is is comes out of the mouth of most of our new agents that come on the team. I don't want to follow up uh, as as you know every day because I don't want to be annoying. And, and I'm telling you, like, like, you're not being annoying. It tells people that you have a system, that, you have a, a con- that you're consistent. And that's the only way that you can build that, 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 that familiarity with them uh, so that they can get to know, like, and trust you through your follow-up. But, uh, you know, for, for me, uh, Fran is, you know, the girl who she, she has a company that does uh, clothing and she's a stylist. And she annoyed the hell out of me, right? Uh, she was DMing me. She was calling me. She was texting me. She was, but I respected it. And uh, and now I, I buy my clothes through her, right? She was everything. And, uh, and, and she is absolutely amazing to work with, but she followed up. She followed up. She followed up. Uh, same thing for uh, uh, coaching companies, you know, that I'm working with and Facebook groups and communities. Uh, like same thing. They're just follow up, follow up, follow up. And I respect that. And I want to work with people that have a system. Obviously, they have a system because they're reaching out to me at the same time every day in the same way. So, uh, yeah, it, if you don't if you if you have the legion without the follow up, you're just banging your head up against the wall. <laughs> and and, uh, and then you can't have follow up if you don't have the leads to follow up with with legion. And I have an example even from my my own personal life in this I was sharing it with one of our agents today on a coaching call. So every single week we have coaching calls with our agents. Uh, either it's a group coaching call or we do one-on-ones. And so we're deep diving into their business. And so I was talking with this agent today about follow-up and she was admitting, you know, we're like, where are we at? We're four months in. How do you feel like if you had to, to grade yourself? And she's like, "My, I would probably not have a, a passing grade and I'm not really doing follow-up. I'm not following up like I should be. And so it's funny that we're now talking about this on, on our podcast, but that conversation with her today, I was like, let me give you a story. I want to paint the picture because she literally used those exact words. I just don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be annoying. And I'm like, my wife asked me to shop for car insurance, right? I already have car insurance. It works fine. We're not overly, we're not paying way too much. We just want to see if we might be able to get a better deal. So I reach out to, uh, to an insurance rep and I said, Hey, can you get me a quote for auto insurance? So I said, Hey, I'm going to need a few things for you so I can put that quote together. Well, it took me a few days to get that stuff because I'm busy. It's not the most important thing in my life at the moment. It's not super high priority because we're not spending too much. So it's the pain isn't great enough. And so it took me a couple of days to like sync up with the wife. I needed to get her driver's license number. I needed to get a copy of our current policy. I had to send it to him. So he followed up with me a couple of times and was like, hey, uh, you know, don't forget to send me X, Y, Z. Right. And I wasn't mad at him, but I also didn't I didn't reply. So he's think he could be thinking I'm being ghosted. It's not. I'm just getting the car insurance quote isn't the most important thing to me at the moment. I know I need to do it. I, I initially did the reach out because I wanted to not forget, but I also I have other things going on. I have contracts and clients, et cetera. So a couple of days later, I send him what he asked for. He puts together the quote. And then now he's followed up with me for the last three days saying like, hey, do you have any questions about your the policy I sent you? You know, are you guys ready to get switched over? And then finally, the one that he sent earlier today was like, hey, are you still interested in switching, you know, home in, or uh, auto insurance policies? And I have not replied to him, not because I don't like him, not because I hate him, because the unread message in my phone is the reminder to me that I need to respond and I need to review the quote. I just haven't had time to do it. And so I'm telling this story and I'm like, this is literally what the sellers and buyers that we're following up with are doing on the other side. It's not that they don't like us or that they hate us because we're being pushy or we're being aggressive. They're, they have other things in life that are more important right now. And until that pain is great enough, they're not going to take action on it. They're going to leave your message unread on their phone because they're going to get to it eventually. And when that pain is great enough or when that desire is great enough to, to, to reach out, then they will. So if, if he had just never sent me the quote because he wasn't sure if I wanted it or not or stopped following up with me, I might forget that I wanted to get this quote that I was originally the one that reached out to him because life would get in the way and three months would go by and be like, oh yeah, I need to get that auto insurance quote. 
Uh, and then I would just, whoever is the auto insurance rep that I've talked to recently, I would reach out to. I might re not reach out to the same person, right? These are what clients and leads are doing on the other side. It's the exact same situation, right? Um, yeah. So your follow-up keeps him, his follow-up is keeping him top of mind. And I'm appreciating that he's doing that because I know I eventually need to reach out. I just haven't yet. Nick, you, I mean, you made a great point. I mean, what, what, we're talking about lead gen in this segment. Uh, and, and think about uh, just using follow-up as lead gen and following up with all of the leads that you have in your database or you know, in your notebook or wherever you keep your leads. Uh, but just following up with them more than the one or two times uh, before you said they were you're, you're getting ghosted, you're not. Uh, you're just terrible at follow up. So go into that uh, that 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 you know that stable of leads that you have and work those leads with uh, excellent follow up, five and seven day follow up. Right. Uh, start a database where you're hitting them. You know all collectively with. Uh, the same message every single week, once or twice. So I think that 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 follow up in and of itself, if you have enough leads, can be lead generation. Yeah, and we've talked about that with our agents, right? Like when it's time to invite them to client appreciation parties, or you know, sending out that weekly newsletter is farming. You you are staying top of mind with these people, and when they're ready, they're going to raise their hand, and you're going to be the one they think about because they've heard from you every single week. So it, it in and of itself, like you have this. 300 people that you've, you know, met at open houses over the last few years. If there's people in there that you haven't talked to recently, go start with them. You don't always have to be going out and talking to a brand new person. What does Tom Ferry say? Like 10 there's 10 of your database is like going to do something. Yeah. So if you have 300 people, there's 30 people in that in that database and that CRM that you have that you haven't talked to in 6 months, a year because you thought that they ghosted you or that they didn't want to do anything that might actually transact, but they're going to transact with the latest agent that's talked to them. And if it's not you, that other agent is going to be the one to get the commission instead of you. Yep. With follow-up, I mean, and everyone's main concern is, well, I don't want to feel like I'm interrupting someone. I don't want to feel like I'm pushy. When you meet like a, a, a potential seller when you're door knocking and you tell them, yeah, I'm going to email you the CMA uh, and then I'll give you a call. We'll go over it. And you email it to them and you call them and they don't answer the phone. You, just by continuing to call them, all you're doing is you're doing exactly what you said you were going to do, right? You meet a prospect at an open house. Yeah, great. It's wonderful to meet you. We'll pick up this conversation tomorrow. I'm going to send you X, Y, and Z that we talked about. And uh, I look forward to us speaking tomorrow. And you call. And then you call again and again and again. All you're doing is you're doing what you said you were going to do, uh, right. which is the makings of a good business. Yeah, you're keeping your word. Yeah, it's, it's changing that mindset. You're not interrupting someone. You're not bothering them. You're simply doing what you said you were going to do. You told them you would follow up with them. Uh, it's not a follow-up until you pick up the phone and we actually speak. So I'm just continuing to follow up because that's what I said I was doing. It's just changing that reference, I think. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Uh, so next up, what we want to talk about. So uh, every, every time that we do one of these podcasts, we're always trying new apps, new services, uh, new things to try to improve our business. Um, and so this this week, we actually want to recommend an app for you. If you have been struggling with putting together videos, you're struggling with utilizing Instagram or utilizing Facebook, and you're trying to edit stuff or utilizing TikTok, uh, we actually uh, have, there's a free app that you can download on, your, download on your phone today, and it's called CapCut. So CapCut actually is made by ByteDance, who made TikTok. Um, and so it is a super streamlined application. It's free to download on your phone. You can download it on your iPad. You can download it on your computer, whether it's PC or Mac. And it lets you edit uh, your videos that you're going to put on social media. The great thing about it, though, is uh, if you've watched videos and you see the subtitles that look like they're custom for every single video and they've got emojis and they've got you know shadows and things that pop up behind your words, all of those things are built into CapCut. So you don't have to work with the video mm -hmm. editor to add them on uh, later on, you know, on your own, you can do it right inside of the app and publish it directly to TikTok, for example, if you wanted to, or download it, save it to your phone and then push it out uh, to the services that you do want to use. But we want to recommend it because it's free. We get a lot of agents who struggle with, uh, you know, they're not, they don't make enough money yet to hire a video editor. Cause I think that's something that you should do. Once you are making enough income, you should not be editing your videos. That's time that's could be spent prospecting, resting, et cetera. But if you got to edit video right now, CapCut lets you edit and push out to all the platforms and it's super easy to use. Uh, Taylor, I think you use CapCut. Uh, yep. any, anything that you have noticed in using it that, you, that makes you recommend it to an agent to use? 
Yeah, I just it, you're able to add in like the uh, the gifts as well, which adds an extra element to your reels and, and social media content. Um, when you're doing the house tour videos, it has a bunch of different transitions and things of that nature as well. So you're really able to um, just add it add an extra element to like the quality. I used to just record my reels on my phone like through the Instagram app. Uh, just like one take, go through it, uh, and or maybe editing a little bit, and it's very clunky on the Instagram app itself. So if you're just looking to streamline the process and just add an extra little layer of kind of quality, so to speak, I think it's a great tool, super easy to use. Uh, I like to joke that I'm uh, 31 going on 70 when it comes to technology, and I can figure it out quite easily. Uh, so if I can use it, you can use it too. And it's a free tool. You don't have to buy one of those expensive ones. Um, there's like a pro account option. Don't get it. You don't need it. Um, yeah, so I, but again, I really just heavily recommend content getting out there, staying top of mind with people. So that's great. Yeah, it's easy. And I mean, it's such a great app, like someone and y'all both know like, like how terrible I am, like with anything technical, uh, I, honest to God that like I can, I can shoot something and then have a really nice, uh, you know, post made through CapCut. It looks like Hermoses or, you know, whoever else with all the, the text and everything, uh the, the captions like all of that within 12 minutes uh like 12 15 minutes and it's just it's super easy to use so uh i use it i love it and i think that for those agents that are having a, a hard time you know with their content I, I i second and third you know you guys i was talking to a friend of mine yesterday uh who like is just now kind of getting into posting a lot of content a lot of videos uh, and I was like, look, you don't need an editor. You can absolutely use CapCut. Uh, eventually, yeah, you, you have an editor, but but you don't need like as an agent, you're not a, a, a media, you know, uh, company. You're, you're a real estate service company. So use things like CapCut or, or, you know, send it out to a video editor when that time comes. But uh, CapCut just makes it easy for me to, to shoot something, make it look way better, sound way better and uh, and post it. Yeah, the only thing I would recommend that you do is if you download CapCut, whether it's on your computer or on your phone, go to the settings and there is a checkbox that you can turn off the outro CapCut logo showing up at the end of your video so that you don't have to go and try to cut the video after you finished it and try to remove that. You can literally just turn that off as a setting. That way you don't have that little uh, video clip of their logo at the end. So I've, I've seen a few agents, they go get CapCut because I told them to use it like Manny on our team, he goes and gets it. And then I see the first video he posts and there's, it does a little bloop. And then you see cap cut at the end. Yeah. I'm like, you, know, you can turn that off. Right. Like, so it's just, again, it helps it lend that credibility that like that this was a more professionally edited video that it doesn't have that logo at the end. Um, and the, the great thing is, uh, is that you can use stuff that you've already rec recorded. So you don't have to like do the filming and everything inside the app. You can use your phone as you normally do, record your videos as is, and then import those into CapCut whenever you're ready to actually edit them. So that's our recommendation for an app for the week. Any final thoughts on the NAR settlement or on lead gen before we close up this week's podcast? The harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, I think a lot of agents are putting their heads in the sand. Uh, I always like try to get like a, a pulse of where like the general census is head is at. And everyone's been very panicky uh, as far as realtors on a national and even local level, I think. Uh, so I zig while everyone else is zagging. Everyone else is freaking out and, and writing about it on the Internet. Uh, get out there and work while everyone else is panicking. And I think you'll, you'll have a great, great year. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's an election year. And, uh, you know, so that everything's going to look nice and pretty, right? It is. But, you know, typically what happens is people start pumping the brakes the closer we get. And they pump the brakes because they don't know what's going to happen. It, it doesn't matter who wins. They just don't know what's going to happen. And the markets are the same way. Uh, and so, you know, that that is something to keep in mind as we get closer uh, to that time of year that uh, buyers and sellers both will probably start pumping the brakes on their ambitions to move uh, to purchase or sell. And so uh, get it done. I mean, really make use of the second and third quarter. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching to the end of this podcast. Again, uh, leave a comment down below what lead generation activities you have found a lot of success in. We'd love to hear from you guys. And if you have thoughts on the NAR settlement and maybe you have tips on scripting or things that you're already starting to see in your conversations with buyers or sellers, prospects that you're meeting, we'd love to hear from you. So comment down below and let us know what you think. Uh, and again, thanks for watching to the end and we'll see you guys on our next video.